As uh, Marlene mentioned earlier, uh, this is our team this morning. We're looking out for uh, particular trends. And I like the way that Marlene did it because there's a fair possibility you remember that illustration even more clearly than some of the ones that I might use. But you know, while the cat's away, the mice will play. And I wonder if it's anything to do with the name of the person who didn't do the lawns. I, I, took, that, I took that rather personally, you know. Um, you know, anyway, uh, that's a personal issue for me to work through. We're, we're um, moving through to the conclusion of this focus in the book of Nehemiah, and it's going to be a rather accelerated conclusion uh, simply because um, to actually look at every detail in the book of Nehemiah does actually require uh, a longer amount of time and a lot more uh, closer interaction with it. Uh, appreciating that on the Sunday it is one-way traffic. I'm sharing with you some of the things that uh, perhaps the Lord's shown me, uh, things that I see in the text myself, uh, and the ways in which I would like to, I suppose, capsulize it in some way and bring it uh, into uh, the, the space of your world. But I would suggest to you that Nehemiah is possibly one of the most relevant of the prophetic books in the Old Testament. Even though it's not prophetic, it is actually a historical record, it still has this prophetic tone. It, it speaks so much uh, about uh, the, the very context in which we are now living, this 21st century, with all of its uh, uh, changing circumstances and dynamics. And, and we're in a place, and, and I know some people uh, might think, well, here we are back in the Old Testament. How can that possibly be relevant uh, to the 21st century? Well, during the week I heard this comment twice. So I thought that could be helpful uh, to getting another handle on the book of Nehemiah. And the comment was this one. The only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Now, we know for a fact that in the context of God's word, that much of it is history. And you sort of say, oh, that's back there. I'm, I'm more concerned about now. Well, I'll tell you what, you look back at Nehemiah and you've got a great little, I suppose, a framework to approach the very now in which we live. The only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. And we open up the pages of Nehemiah and we will find not so much a YouTube, not so much video clips, but we will find a script that describes personalities, it describes uh, our context, it describes trends, it describes achievements, it describes uh, uh, celebrations. It describes a lot of the things that we would find in the context of this very um, moment in which we are living. There is so much for us to see, so much for us to learn. So when I sing the song, as many of us were do, ju doing just a few moments ago, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. What am I doing? Am I prepared to open my heart and sort of say, well, okay, what's this event of history speaking into the very condition of my own heart? And I can look at these pages, 20 pages of, of this massive book we call the Bible is given over to Nehemiah. I can read those 20 pages and I can look and say, wow, that's amazing. Look at how God's people got it right. Look at that amazing leadership that Nehemiah was giving. Oh, look how quickly God's people got out of step again. It's a mix. If we think it's just one-way traffic, like we just keep marching forward and nothing goes wrong, there's no issues to deal with, we never celebrate, never have a good time. It's the whole mix, the whole reality of life is portrayed in the context of this uh, Old Testament narrative. So now I want to put it to you. And I know, I know for a fact that, um, you know, I rattle on each Sunday morning something about Nehemiah. And I believe that on four of the eight occasions that I've spoken into this particular book, from this particular book, 
uh, that I have asked you to sort of give us, give us some feedback. What are you finding as you read through the pages? And so I put it to you again. What have you seen? What have you found? Now Marlene shared with us this morning, and it's, it's a wonderful resource that we have in some of the devotional books that are provided for us. And I know Selwyn Hughes will go down in, in my journey as a most amazing man who has resourced my life in a whole lot of ways because he was a teacher. He also happened to be an evangelist. And it's great to have these resources that are available. But if I'm approaching the Word of God, I'm going to discover what God is actually saying into my life right now, and my life now becomes a story. It becomes a story that's got something of the overlay of the script that God has been using through generations. So I ask you, in preparation, this is, you know, in Parliament they often have a sir, question without notice. Would you like a question without notice? Well, I'll give you a week's notice. What have you seen? What have you found? As a result of being prepared to journey through, and, and, and I'll give you one little out. You don't have to make a considered response to all the long words. Just look, what's happening here? What am I seeing? What have I found? What's now gone into the store, as it were? What has gone into the store of my mind that the Spirit of God can now use as a quickening point for me? Because that's how he works. What goes in, he uses. If there's rubbish that goes in, most times he'll grab hold of it and throw it out, just like we see Nehemiah did in that brief little script that Jenny read to us, read for us. So I, I put it before you, and you can bring your comments up until Thursday midday. Send them through on email or a text or a message to the office. Uh, that that'll be really good. And uh, we'll see what we've found, what it is that's been stored. May, may require a little bit of sitting down and sort of thinking about it a little bit further. And I know for a fact that the value of that exercise will be significant. May not be immediately significant, but it will be significant. Because it may happen that what you've seen over the last few weeks, what you've found over the last few weeks, will come to bear its fullest impact six months down the road. Because it's stored away, the Spirit of God says, that's the word for now. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, you know, don't, don't be anxious when people uh, drag you into court and call you to give account for your faith. He says, because the Spirit of God will quicken a word to you. And he won't quicken it out of, thick, out of thin air. He won't suddenly bring to your mind something you've never heard before. He'll bring to mind something that has already been installed. It's how your brain works. Did you know that? It's how your brain, well, I should say it's how it's meant to work. Anyway, but that's, that's how we work, you know. And I, I find that even more challenging these days because it was being mentioned also this morning of how sometimes our faith might be challenged. People might ask something about our faith. Click, click, Spirit of God says, got that in the file. And you know, you could see how I was uh, trying to master my technology on my phone. It could have taken me 10 minutes. You could have all been having another cup of coffee or something. But the Spirit's a lot quicker than I am. As quick as that. It'll come to mind. But if it's not stored, what can he draw? Well, he'll draw out some smart comment that you've heard from some clown on the television. No, he won't. There'll be a human nature bringing that one out. The Spirit of God wants to bring out the testimony of the Word because he knows using that instrument, which is his main instrument, it's sharp. It's got the capacity to do the cutting and reach the deepest point. Anyway, right. This is high-speed travel from, um, you, for those who have been counting over the last few weeks, 
we got to Nehemiah 8 and suddenly we find ourselves in Nehemiah 13. So this is the accelerated sort of little lead up to 13 for you. I move rapidly just simply because of uh, some, of the, some of the space that is travelled has already been travelled in the earlier chapters. Okay, so from uh, chapter 9 through and 10, we, we see um, Nehemiah telling, rerunning something of the history of God's people from Moses to his time. Now that's something that happens regularly through uh, the narrative of the Old Testament. There's a regular reference. It's, it's like as if, uh, for those who watch the ABC News, for example, and you'll see the finance report. Does anybody watch the finance report? It's riveting, riveting viewing. And regularly you'll see one graph after another graph and then another graph and then another graph. And I'm still trying to understand the terms of the first one and he's already on the fourth one. Uh, so I've got a great understanding of the, how the financial world works. It goes something like this. Is that right? Guess what this uh, graph would look like if we put it in graph form and put it on the ABC. Here's God's people. Anything like your life and my life? There we go. That was a simple illustration, wasn't it? Now you match that one to cats away the mice will play. We're going frontwards. All right, good. But this is the, the narrative. This is the testimony of Nehemiah. So we go through 9 and 10. And that's what that's about, telling that story. Chapter 11 provides uh, for those people who would like to join um, uh, in this, this challenging venture of reading these fantastic names of the Old Testament. There's a whole chapter of them. Uh, so Don's nodding. He's ready for another round, uh, which is really good. And then we get to chapter 12 and we see this, this brief uh, presentation of a, of a a bunch of people, uh, priests and Levites, who uh, get their name up front. It's like as if it's a list of names that says these people were significant part of bringing together with, with Nehemiah this great celebration. Now, again, I've got to draw on something that hope, hopefully you can picture. You remember the, the great achievement that God's people uh, are... are you know, celebrating after just 52 days. Nehemiah leads them in this great project of restoring these walls. Massive task. And there's a whole lot of things that make it happen. And Zechariah says it's happened because the Spirit of God inspired the hearts of a whole lot of people to say, I'm in. And away it went, 52 days. So they, they organised this group of people. It's like an organising committee for a Thanksgiving service or something or another. There is this great celebration, and it is, it is like the, the Tokyo Olympics. It's, it's orchestrated. It's got music. It's got people coming up and down and parachutes flying in, and perhaps not parachutes flying in, but the, 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 the aspect of celebration was a, was a very, very dominant theme in that particular chapter. Uh, and so chapter 12, and we think, wow, this is an amazing. Why don't we just finish the text there? And, 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 you know, we've got the whole thing on a, on a high note. Well, it doesn't happen. The reality says we've got to watch out for the trends. And so we turn to uh, chapter 13. And I'm only going to spend uh, a little bit of time here just to highlight some of the things that Nehemiah addresses as trends. Now, as we approach chapter 13, it's important to put just a little timeline in place. Right? We remember that uh, Nehemiah came back to Jerusalem from Babylon, and he is got this great heart for this project. It's, it's part two of a three-part project, and he does his particular part extremely well. He's ha he, ha he is able to do that literally by the grace of God, and he has been given a position of government by Artaxerxes, uh, the, the, the king of Babylon, Persia now, uh, that 
uh, he, he now realizes he's got space to, as it were, show authority and leadership that is really quite amazing. Well, his term as governor has gone, uh, has, has now concluded. It's a six year term. He has returned to Babylon. So you could say the cat is away. He is no longer in the context of Jerusalem. And it seems like, yeah, trends are going to appear. And because they are numerous, I'll put it in illustration something like this. So what was fresh, new, restored, alive, and working has now begins to deteriorate. Things are going backwards in a space of months. How quickly, how tragically Nehemiah has retained connections when he was in Jerusalem and the whole wall restoring process was undergone. He retained connection with Artaxerxes because he had accountability there, because he was appointed as a governor. He was able to fulfill two major tasks. One was a God calling and one was a government calling by Artaxerxes. He was able to maintain community harmony and at the same time, achieve something that God had laid on his heart. Now that is a challenge for any Christian leader. Any leader of faith is to be true to your call in God and be true to authority that is over you. It's what Paul addresses a little bit later on in acknowledging as he writes to the, city, to the Christian community in the city of Rome. He says, you acknowledge the authority that's over you but also know the authority of God on your life. And Nehemiah does that extremely well. So he's maintained this connection, this connection with Artaxerxes in a governance sense and the connection with his God calling. His connection with the God calling is made for a strong connect with the community of faith in Jerusalem. And so he's still hearing how things are going. And he's deeply concerned that so soon after this great celebration of the completement of the completion of a stage stage two he realizes things are starting to go backwards how tragic so very quickly he's on his camel and he's back in Jerusalem and he rolls up to the city and what does he see? He sees the walls in perfect condition. Nothing wrong with the walls. Stage two has been done well. But then he looks at what was stage three. I don't know if you can remember stage three. It was only last Sunday we looked at stage three. Can you remember what it was? It was Ezra. Stage three was making sure the people of faith had the word of God well and truly installed in their hearts. You remember that? See, that's the bit we easily forget. So easily forget. Because we can see the tangible. The achievement that has been uh, made in a tangible sense is very, oh, it's looking, it's looking snappy. But what's happening in regards to re retaining what it is that the Lord has installed on the heart? What have they heard? Has it run deep? Has it made the claim, as it were, on that very core of their identity? And we discover that it hasn't. And so it is that not just in those first 11 verses, because we realize if we did read through right through to the end of chapter 13, 
we would just discover that um, Jenny has a lot of long names to read. But these are the things that Nehemiah highlights as trends. And we know that this morning we prayed again for the leadership of our fellowship, and that's a valid prayer. But these are the things that Nehemiah highlighted. So this is two and a half thousand years ago. Does history tend to repeat itself? Leadership in the community of faith need to be totally clear on what their calling is. Number two, supporting the legitimate ministries of those appointed to serve the community of faith needs to be maintained. Number three, people of faith need to know the sanctity, the holy purpose of the places of gathering. Now you can, well, hopefully you can see this, this is an Old Testament context, but if you look at these just on a personal basis, we realize this is, this is not orientated to one group of people. This is something of the trends that spreads right across the community of faith so easily. The fourth one that Nehemiah highlights, clearly defined boundaries of time are best to be observed for the health of all. In this particular occasion, it's the purpose of the Sabbath. And we could say, well, that's Old Testament. No, it's not. It's the reality. If we don't carve out time to be stilled, to draw aside, and it was highlighted yesterday in our conversations uh, on the natural church development. It's one of, one of the comments that was made from within the context of the gathering. And we know that that is true. The people of faith need to understand what holy looks like. We sang it 47 times this morning. And we, say, we use the term, and do we realize what it, what it is? What, what does it look like? For they are a people in a covenant relationship with the Holy God. And it hasn't changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That feature doesn't change. I will have a people for myself. They will be a holy people. Peter says in his little short letter, Be holy because God's holy. Terrific. I'll go for that. Do you know what it means? You don't stop ever becoming holy. Not one person in this room has arrived. It is a process. It is something we need to stand under and experience for ourselves. This understanding needs to be, to be at both a personal and a community level. What it means to be not just a holy individual, but to be a holy community. And then finally, they get longer as they go along, you would have noticed. People of faith need to be totally aware that the restoration, reforming, renewing work that God is doing by His Spirit is for the purpose that the community of faith is able to continue to influence the world around rather than the world around influencing the community of faith. Does that sound current? Well, here's Nehemiah, two and a half thousand years ago, trumpeting the same thing. He says, I can see those trends. He marched back into Jerusalem and he grieved because of what he could see. Now I realise there's possibly, uh, I could give some attention to those points, but I think most of them are clear enough and most of them are current enough. So I want to finish with this beautiful phrase, and it is a bit of a leap, but we've, we've motored through this morning quite, quite a, uh, a distance in the sense of not just geographically and historically, but Nehemiah addressed these terms, and I, I do say this honestly, he didn't address it as a, a five-minute portion of the annual general meeting of the community of faith, where we all took a vote and said, yeah, that's a good idea. He was back in Jerusalem for years, addressing these issues. The one event that Jenny read out happened almost immediately. He marched in, he could see something that one of the key leaders had done that compromised the sanctity of the temple. And he says, not going to have that. And he did exactly what Jesus had done when he drove the, 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 the money changers out of the temple. He says, no, 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 that will never happen. 
out. We thought, well, that's, that's tidied it all up. No, he then proceeded to address all of these issues, these trends that he could see. They were, they were rising up, and if we allow them to rise up, then it is that there is... <laughs> It's, it's an undoing. And we, and we, the, if we're not going forward in a restoration process, we're going backwards. So uh, that's, that's why Paul says, you know, present yourselves as a living sacrifice so God can keep doing the process, the, the restoring work inside of you, inside of your community, so that all of his glorious purposes can be fulfilled. Now, I said I wanted to finish, and this is what I finish with. Anybody remember what the old cause I used to look? I like to bring up things that are topical and stir people. All right? Can you remember what the old causeway looked like? Well, that's not what the picture's about. I just thought it was a nice picture to put the script on. But right at the end of the chapter, it's almost like a postscript. Nehemiah says, Remember me, O oh my God, for good. I read that. That's in the context of the Old Testament. That is an amazing personal statement of trust. Because here's Nehemiah saying, "God, I've I've understood the law. I've understood the law of Moses. I've understood your personal touch on my life." I've understood your calling into being a part of this restoring, reforming work. And I've given it my best shot. Remember me. Of course God would remember him. But he's in a context where, unlike you and I, we can make that statement with a great sense of assurance. If, I, if I've owned the name of Jesus and saying, Lord, I, I see that that work's completed and I know that you want me to be a part of the ongoing completing work and I know that my name's written, I know my name's recorded and I know the details of my personal journey are still being, as it were, put in that place where ultimately I'll stand before my creator and you'll say, But for Nehemiah, he was saying, Oh my God, remember me for good. I gave it my best shot. And we're encouraged in the testimony of the scriptures to do all things as unto the Lord. Give it our best shot by every provision that he's made for us to live out our lives in the calling that is clearly upon us and the sustaining grace of his spirit upon us. So I conclude with a reminder of a question with notice. What have I seen? What have I found? And together we continue to explore, unwrap and experience every portion of God's restoring, renewing, reforming work that he wants to complete. Amen.